Hey, if you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me to Colossians chapter 4. We're finishing up our study uh, entitled, When Christ is First. And what does it look like when Christ is first in our lives? And uh, as we've been seeing week in and week out, for those of you who are visiting, those of you who are here, or the family and friends just seeing these baptisms, I'll just tell you, we've been going through the entire book of Colossians, and it's been amazing. And the whole book of Colossians focuses on this verse from Colossians 1.8 that ends by saying, so that Jesus might come to have first place in everything. and That Jesus Christ may come to have first place in everything, first place in your heart, first place in your affections, first place in your serving and your ministerings, first in your religion, first in your uh, ministry, first in your church, first in your, uh, your, uh, your family, first in your work, in every different place. We've seen it over and over and over. And so I just want to ask you today, is Christ first in you? As we've been going through these things, as even bringing areas to, to light where, where you, need to, you need to lay those things down and say, Jesus, I need more of you in my life, and I need you here. And I'm not making you first in these things, but you deserve to be first. And today, I want to make you first in these things. Well, for, we're finishing that study today uh, with the last uh, few verses in Colossians chapter 4. And so if you have your Bibles, I'm going to read the whole thing and uh, see if you can figure out Uh, something interesting about this passage, starting in verse 7. Tychicus will tell you about my activities. He is a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I've sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage our hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who who is one of you, they will tell you everything that has taken place here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Epaphras, who was one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers of Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Now we hear these, uh, these verses, and some of you may be thinking about it, like going like, I don't know how you're going to get a sermon out of that, Pastor. Like, it's all about people. It's like Paul's giving these final greetings, right? right? It's like that final to-do list that your mom sends you off with, and she's like, okay, and Max, you need to go do this chore, and Alex, I want you to do this, and by the time I get home, Emily, have the dishes done, and, and Miles, take the dog out, you know, and she, all the different things. But there's a message in here. Do you know that all Scripture is God-breathed? All Scripture is inspired by God, and it's given to us for our teaching, correction, rebuking, and training in righteousness. And today, we're going to learn from this church and the church in Colossae that Paul was ministering to and writing to as well. And so we're going to begin with this thought this morning. When Christ is first in our church, we are serving. When Christ is first in our church, we are serving. Remember Tychicus in the very beginning? It said, Tychicus will tell you all about my activities, verse 7. He's a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. And I've sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Tychicus served so faithfully. He's mentioned throughout a scripture in many different places. In fact, Tychicus was actually Paul's Pony Express, right? When Paul wanted to send a letter, in fact, the letter that is coming that we're reading here, the Colossians letter, was sent through Tychicus to the Colossians. And he brought that letter. He also brought the letter to the Ephesians. Tychicus was also seen in 2 Corinthians 8 as being the one that Paul gave all of the monies that were raised for the poor who were suffering a famine. And he gave it to Tychicus to take to Jerusalem for those beloved believers who 
were in distress. But Tychicus also served as an interim pastor. He stepped in for Titus when Titus was given a break and get, got a chance to go visit Paul. He stepped in for Timothy as well in Ephesus when Timothy needed to go see Paul. And Tychicus came in, served the church, preached in their place, and uh, was living a life of service. And for the follower of Christ, when we're putting Christ first in our lives, we are serving. And for a church that is putting Jesus first, we are a church that is serving. When I think of servants, I think of DT and Megan Thomas, right? Uh, they serve everywhere around here. Now, I will tell you, both of them do not like being pointed out. They don't like even the fact that I mentioned their names in service in the service this morning because they're like, man, I just want to serve the Lord. I don't want all the credit. Give it to Jesus, right? Uh, but I'll tell you, man, when you watch their lives, you go and watch their lives. They are a living example and an illustration for us of what it looks like. They're the first ones here. They're the last ones to leave. They are involved in so many different areas, just helping to build God's kingdom. Now, is that true in your life? Because if we're going to be a church that puts Jesus first, this is something that we can't just leave to DT and Megan, right? Or we can't leave to the 20% to do all the work and the 80% just kind of show up and chill out. We all have to come. So if you are here, if this is your church, I encourage you, let's be a church where Jesus is first. Let's get involved serving him here. Here's the second thing we see. When Christ is first in our church, we are growing. We are growing. Notice what he said in verse 9. He said this, And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they will tell you everything that has taken place here. Now that is a powerful statement because you don't even know his, his story, but Onesimus served in the home of Philemon. And he was a servant in that home. And uh, Philemon was his master. And Onesimus, before he came to know Jesus, was serving in Philemon's home, and he stole from him. And he stole and took what was Philemon and he left and, uh, and he ran away. And so Philemon and Onesimus were at battle. And we're actually going to go into Philemon in a little, uh, little bit, in a couple weeks, and look at that way in which the relationships were restored and the relationships were fixed. But what we're starting to see is the transformation that begins that growth process. Onesimus' heart was transformed by the gospel. He was changed, and he was changed so much that he was growing, and he, Paul would call him the faithful and beloved brother. We also see it in Epaphras' life, verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you also. Now, Epaphras was the one who actually came and brought the gospel to the Colossians. He's the one who evangelized them and actually planted the church. But it says that he's always struggling on your behalf in his prayers. I mean, could you just see that? How many of you struggle in prayer? Some of you parents struggling for your children in prayer. For some of you uh, who have a loved one who doesn't know Jesus yet and you are struggling in prayer, praying that they would come to give their lives to Jesus. You know what it's like to struggle in prayer. Always struggling on your behalf in his prayers that you may stand mature and fully assured in the, all the will of God. For I bear witness of him that he worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and Hierapolis. These men were growing in Jesus, and they were affecting the faith of others and helping to disciple others and praying for others and raising others up and teaching them how to follow after the ways of Jesus. They were working for their growth. And did you know that that's part of our role as a church? Is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Not just to get them saved, but also to help them walk after and obey all the things that Christ has commanded us. And there's that growth factor. And if we're going to be a church where Jesus is first, it's, we need to be a church that's growing. A church that is growing. Not necessarily outwardly. Now sometimes that happens. Sometimes when God is doing a work in an area, many more people are coming and he's adding to their number day by day. But this is not speaking just of external growth or numbers growth. This is talking about heart change. This is talking about life change. The kind of change we saw from these baptisms. The kind of things that we were hearing of people's lives before Christ. And then that moment when Jesus showed up, whether it was in the Apostle Paul kind of moment like Jared, or it was just in the faithful witness of parents like Carwin, just to hear of how God transforms a life and to continue to grow and to see how compassion became more of the heart and how judgment was left by the wayside and we didn't walk around with this air that I'm God and I know what it, there's a humility that's being birthed. We're growing in him. And when Christ is first in our church, we are growing. Are you growing? Are you growing? Are, are, are you different today than you were 
a month ago, uh, three months ago, five years ago, because you're following after Jesus, responding uh, to his spirit and learning his word and growing and walking in that? Are you growing? Man, if we're going to be a church that honors Jesus, that puts Jesus on the throne and Jesus above all, we got to be a church that is growing. Here's a third point we see. When Christ is first in our church, we are willing to suffer. We are willing to suffer. Look at verse 10. It says this, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you. So this is the guy who's chained next to Paul. This is the guy who is in prison. Paul is in prison while he's writing this very letter to the Colossians. While he's sending them his love, sending them the goodness of the word of God to them. Aristarchus is there with him and they are chained in prison for the name of Jesus for sharing the gospel. A man who is willing to suffer for the name of Jesus. But it goes on. And he says this, he says, And Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice. Now, there were some people in the Bible who were named Jesus when Jesus walked the earth and when Jesus was crucified. And more often than not, um, not like today where we name them Jesus because, or Jesus because we want to honor Jesus. Back then, they were like, there is no one else like Jesus. I'm not going to be called Jesus. So they took on a surname. They took on a a different name, and so they called this Jesus justice, so he wouldn't be known uh, in the same line as the one and only Jesus. Jesus, who is called justice, meaning righteous one. That's what the church named him. These are the only men, Paul said, of the circumcision, meaning they were Jews, right? These were Jewish believers, and he said, these are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Now, Mark and Aristarchus and Justice, these guys were willing to suffer for the cause of Christ. They were so willing to suffer, in fact, that they, well, um, especially for, uh, for Mark and for Justice, these Jews who came to know Jesus, for them to, uh, to put their faith and their trust in Jesus and to claim the name of Jesus when they believed in Jews, uh, the Jews, for them they would get greater persecution, they would get greater suffering, and it was putting a mark on their back that everybody was going after them because they had turned away from what they had been taught and embraced this Messiah. And it gives us an example that when Christ is first in our church, we are willing to suffer. We're willing to suffer. Now, that's not a popular message today in, in, in America. In America, we want to we be happy. We want to be healthy. We want to be wealthy and wise, right? And, and how can I get more of that in my life? And yet the Bible says that in this world, we will have trouble. In fact, Jesus told his disciples those very words. He's like, you should understand, like, it's not going to be easy. And if you choose to follow me, it's not going to be easy. So it's not a cakewalk. It's not like, hey, come to Jesus because he makes everything better and your life perfect and happy and gleeful. No, no, no. Actually, there is some difficulty that will come because you choose the name of Jesus. But there is a greater reality, a greater end, where there will be joy in his presence forever. There will be blessing. There will be joy. There will be rewards. There will be happiness for eternity. And yet today, there's difficulty that will come. In this world, you will have trouble. And so, as a church, if we're going to put Jesus first, we have to say, I'm going to be a Jesus follower even if it costs me. I'm going to be a Jesus follower even if it's not the most comfortable thing to do in my classroom, in my community center, in my uh, workplace, in my home. I'm going to follow Jesus. And when Christ is first in our church, we are willing to suffer. You know who I think of in our church who's like this? Andrew Von Gillern. He's our elder board chairman. He's going to be coming off the elder board, taking a break for a, for a year. But I'm telling you, this guy has served faithfully, faithfully for so many years. I'm so thankful to him for his ministry. And um, if you know what it's like to, to lead and be a leader, sometimes leading is lonely, right? Being on top, they say, is, is a lonely place. And, uh, and sometimes, especially when you're serving the people of God, when you're serving and standing for Jesus, sometimes you have to take hits and you have to be uh, willing to endure suffering. And I can remember times at which we were going through such difficult things, whether lies were being spread about us or we were going through an incredibly difficult time at the church or somebody was just going sideways and we had to come along graciously with them. And I remember just apologizing to him so many times just going man I am so sorry that you got to do this and you know what I never heard I never heard him going woe is me not once you know what in fact you know what he said he said I don't know why but I think God made me for this 
<laughs> right? And, and then I was like, you're weird. <laughs> no, no, I didn't say that. No, I, no, in fact, my respect and my admiration for him went through the roof because I'm like, he knew the calling that he had on his life. And he knew that in his heart and in his life, Jesus would be first. And he said, man, I'm going to do what it takes for Jesus to be church first in this church, even if that means that I've got to suffer or it's difficult from time to time. Are you willing to do that too? Are you willing to take the cost that it is to follow Jesus? Are you willing to uh, take that cross life or that cruciform life, that life that is like Jesus where he said, if anyone would follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For if anyone would find his life, he must lose it. But if anyone loses his life for my sake, he will find it. Friends, are you willing to take up that cross life? Take up your cross daily and follow him? When Christ is first in our church, we are willing to suffer. Here's a fourth point we see. When Christ is first in our church, we are forgiving. We are forgiving. Now, doesn't that just feel good in your heart? I don't know about you, but as soon as I hear that, I'm like, man, how desperately we need more forgiveness. How much forgiveness is needed in the body of Christ today? I mean, how much has, has, have we seen churches broken and, and destroyed and ripped apart and their witness just put into the ground and become dust because no forgiveness was extended and yet we see it exemplified here. We, we already read about it a little bit, but, but let's go back to that. Let's go back to that forgiveness. Verse 10 says, Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. Now, friends, you have to understand what this is. For, for, for Mark, Mark deserted Paul and Barnabas when they went on an earlier journey. Mark was brought along. Mark was involved in their ministry. He was very young. He didn't know anything about ministry, but he had a whole lot of zeal. He's like, I'm going to go after it. And Paul and Barnabas brought him along. And, 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 and as, as they started uh, sharing the gospel, all of a sudden persecution came and difficulties came. And Paul began to lean on Barnabas for his encouragement and lean on Mark. And in the midst of, once he started to lean on Mark, Mark was like, this is too hot for me. I don't want any of this. And he bolted and he left. And he deserted them and left them to be persecuted alone. I'm sure Paul's heart was just broken. I'm sure he felt betrayed. I'm sure he felt like he just was abandoned in the midst of difficult ministry or significant ministry that was going on. And yet that wouldn't be the end. Somewhere along the way, Mark repented. Somewhere along the way, Mark looked and, and he saw what he did and he's like, I was wrong. Somewhere along the way, he went back to Paul. He said, I'm sorry I did that. I was wrong. And by God's grace, I'm never going to do that again. And so he began to serve with Barnabas. Paul wasn't ready to trust him yet because he wasn't worthy of that trust yet. But he went and served with Barnabas and showed himself faithful and continued to do differently than he had. And Paul is now his ally. Paul is now his supporter. Paul is now standing up on behalf of Onesimus. And he's like, we need to receive him. We need to restore him back into fellowship. This brother who had sinned, this brother who had erred, this brother who had denied the name of Jesus Christ at the very moment that he needed to, he's come back. And we need to embrace him once again. Literally, he says, he's like, our faithful and beloved brother Onesimus, who is one of you. I love that because he's like, do we not all need forgiveness? Yeah, amen, right? We all say that with a heavy heart going, yeah, I need it today. I needed it yesterday. I needed it this week. I need it last month. I need it like all the time, right? He's one of us. That his story is us. That we need that. Oh, excuse me. I'm on Onesimus, but let's go to Mark. Some of you are probably like, why are we talking about that guy now? Right. You were on. I was off. Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions. So Paul gave instructions to them. If he, if he comes, welcome him. Welcome him. Don't shun him for his sin anymore, but receive him back to yourself. 
And that is a restoring part of forgiveness. There are three words to forgiveness. There is the releasing, that's the first stage. The second stage is reconciling. That's where they uh, exchange apologies and they come back to peace again. That third part is the fullness of forgiveness where you restore them back into relationship. You give them opportunity to build trust once again and restore their, uh, their faithfulness once again. And as that happens, Paul's like, man, let us be a forgiving people. How many times has somebody hurt us and we're like, I will never let them go, right? Because you feel so violated or you felt stolen from or it hurts so deeply or it kept going on over and over and over and you're like, I will never forgive them. Or maybe you're like, well, Jesus tells me and I'm going to forgive them, but you're not right with them yet because they haven't admitted their fault and come to you and said, hey, I was wrong. Will you please forgive me, right? But are you ready if they came to you? Some of you, they have come, and you still won't give them that forgiveness. Friends, as a follower of Christ and as a church that wants to put Jesus first, we are doing what he did for us and forgiving them, extending that forgiveness when they come and ask, and even allowing them the opportunity to rebuild that reputation once again and to rebuild that equity, to welcome them back into friendship, to welcome them back into fellowship. Now, we don't give them a full, a full measure of just the doors are wide open, we're going to put you back in leadership, you're going to go on another missionary journey, no, no, there's steps and there's stages. But as, as followers of Jesus, we have to aim for restoration, as the Apostle Paul said at the end of 2 Corinthians. Aim for restoration, which is the fullness of forgiveness. When Christ is first in our church, we are forgiving. I remember a woman who uh, used to come to our church many years ago. Her name was Sarah, and, uh, and her husband was cheating on her. Her husband had been cheating on her, and he been cheating on her multiple times they came in for counseling and as you can imagine their fam their marriage was you know hanging on by a thread and they were both claimed to be believers Sarah began to show it in in just amazing ways now in that situation the Bible would actually give permission for there to be divorce to to divorce the 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 offending brother or sister but she looked at it and she said, look at what God has forgiven me. And so she said, I'm, I'm willing to forgive. I'm willing to forgive. I want to continue to work at this. I want God to be glorified in our relationship. And she forgave him. And he did it again. Came back into counseling. We were working on it. Forgiveness. Even when it hurts. Even when it's hard. She was willing if, if we're going to be that kind of a church, we have to commit to one another. You have to commit to me, but I have to commit to you. I'm going to forgive you when you hurt me. And I'm going to ask the same of you. Will you forgive me when I hurt you? When I sin against the Lord, will you forgive me? And when you sin against the Lord, I will forgive you. Let's continue to be a church of grace that recognizes that the reason Jesus came wasn't for a bunch of perfect people who would just, you know, clap that he was here and, well done, Jesus. No, he went, came because he, he knew there was a bunch of people who needed forgiveness, and he offered it to us. And that's the story of these baptisms. That's the story of our lives, that when Jesus came to earth, he came to give the forgiveness that no one else could give, the forgiveness from God Almighty, our Creator. He gives a forgiveness and a peace that lasts. Will you be part of that? Let's make Christ first in our church and, and forgive one another. Here's another point this morning that we see. When Christ is first in our church, we are stewarding our gifts. We are stewarding our gifts. We're stewarding our gifts. Look at uh, verse 14. It says this, Luke, the beloved physician, greets you. Uh, as does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the churches of the Laodiceans and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. Now, friends, what we are seeing there is we are seeing people who are willing to use their gifts for the name of Jesus. 
Luke was a physician. And do you know that Luke went along with Paul and, and, and was serving Paul and caring for Paul? And he used his medical knowledge and his physician skills to serve Paul, but also to serve the people. They probably did some medical missions work. I mean, sometimes the Apostle Paul was just healing them on the spot. Sometimes Luke was using his, his physician skills, and they were using those things for the, the kingdom. But not only that, uh, Luke was using his intelligence and his skills in writing to write some of the gospel that we read, the, the gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, the second chapter of that book. That is the work of Luke, using his gifts for the sake of the church and stewarding those gifts for his kingdom. And when Christ is first in our church, we're stewarding those gifts. But don't forget about Nympha. Nympha was an awesome lady, man. She was a powerhouse. This lady, I don't know if she was a single lady or if her faith was just so strong, like that's how she got known. But when, uh, when uh, the Colossian church uh, began to be uh, birthed, she opened up her home so they could meet there. And they could do church in her home. And the church was birthed in her house. So she is giving of her home. She's giving of her resources. She is hosting people in her own house so that the church can grow. And that's what happens in the life of, of people whose lives are transformed and they're like, man, Jesus is first now. Jesus is first. They're like, my stuff doesn't belong to just me. My stuff now belongs to Jesus. How can I use it for your namesake? Luke could have been like, well, my, my total identity is as a doctor and everything I do is as a doctor and I'm a doctor and I do doctor stuff. No, his identity was changed, and he's like, I have doctor skills that God gave me the intelligence for, and I worked very hard for, but now these skills are at the use of the king, and I'm going to use that to bless God's people. I'm going to use that to help others come to know Jesus. Is that true in your life? Are, are you uh, using the things that God has given you and stewarding those gifts for, uh, for the kingdom? Man, uh, the people that come to my mind first off are Dave and Marianne Hatton. So uh, just we got to see your uh, testimony today, and I know you guys don't want any praise for this, but you're an example to us, and I just love how our examples live out these these things. I mean, Dave, you are a uh, uh, you are a, a certified financial counselor. You uh, you give wise counsel to people, Dave. It, it, the guy gets paid for this, but he ends up teaching a class here that tells everybody everything he knows. Well, most of what he knows, or some of what he knows, probably a small little bit. But he's giving it away for free for weeks after weeks after weeks, giving away this financial counseling. That's like, the, that's like Luke was. That's using what you have and going, man, it, how can I bless God's people? How can I bless the church? Or Marianne, she has such a heart of serving. And if Marianne didn't reach out to James, I wonder if James is in this church. And I wonder if James is in the baptistry getting baptized. Well, I wonder if James would know a love from, uh, from a woman when he didn't have it from his birth mom. And now he has and, and seen it in Marianne. Now he's seeing it in his real mom. Like, that's how the church continues to grow. When people are taking their gifts and using them for the cause of Christ. You've been given a gift too. Not just physical gifts and material gifts. You've been given those, sure. But you've been given a gift as well. Maybe you sing. Maybe you have the ability to teach. Maybe you're just a hard worker or an administrative person. Maybe you're somebody who serves behind the scenes. You're like, I don't ever want to be on stage. God can use you to build this church. And we need the entire body. And when Christ is first in our church... We are stewarding our gifts together for his glory. Last point here this morning. When Christ is first in our church, we are remaining faithful. We are remaining faithful. Uh, verse 14 says, Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Now we read his name here, but there's a real tragic story that happens with Demas. A real tragic story that happens in Demas's life. See, what happens to Demas is he starts out really well. And then we find out at the end of Paul's ministry, at the end of Paul's life, Demas also abandoned him. And, and not only abandoned him, but abandoned the faith. Why did he abandon the faith? Why did he stop going to church? Why did he stop sharing Jesus with his friends? Why did he stop living for Jesus? Why did he stop being about these? Why did he stop believing? Because it says that he fell in love with this world. It's a tragic story. And to see his name, friends, I have to just tell you the reality that there are some here, there are some here who your name may be Demas. 
I know you've got a different name. I, in fact, I don't know anybody whose name is Demas here, but maybe your story will be just like him. And I just want to encourage you today, let nothing come before Jesus. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's an addiction. I don't care if it's a pleasure. I don't care if it's a reputation or a career. I don't care if it's a, it's a lover or it's a friend. There is nothing in this world that is more precious and valuable and beautiful and soul satisfying than Jesus Christ. And friends, I will just plead with you, hear me today. We need to continue to draw near to him. We need to continue to draw near to him. And some of you are coming back today. Some of you are hearing these testimonies and you're turning from your sin today. You're going like, I gotta get, I gotta get right with you. I gotta get right with you, Jesus. And that is awesome. Don't let Satan snatch that seed. Because you're going to walk outside this room. You're going to walk outside the service and you're going to go back to your normal life. And you know what Satan's going to be doing? He's going to put everything in your way to distract you or he's going to send all the temptation in your way. Listen, if you fall into sin and you struggle with sin, come back to church. Don't go away from church because you're afraid I can't, all these people are going to judge me. Guess what? You're judged already. You're judged already. Come back to church so you can experience grace. Because you got a bunch of people here. Scripture says we all fall in many ways. Scripture says that every single one of us will fall into sin. It's not a question of will we. It's a question of what we do when we fall into sin. Do we come back to Jesus? Do we turn back to Him? Do we come back and receive the grace and the forgiveness and the love? Do we continue to walk in His ways and go, man, I fell again. I'm, I stumbled again. I, I'm, and, and come and get encouragement from the people. That's how you don't become Demas. Some will fall away. But when Christ is first in our church, we're remaining faithful like Archippus and Paul. It says in verse 17, And say to Archippus, See that you fulfill the ministry that you've received in the Lord. What an encouraging word that must have been for Archippus, as well as a challenge for him, that the Apostle Paul would mark his life. And he said, man, you have a ministry from the Lord. And he's like, see that you fulfill it. Don't give up. Don't fall by the wayside. And you know what happened? He did. <laughs> he did. And you go to Philemon, verse 2, and it says in Philemon, verse 2, that he says, Archippus, my fellow soldier, he looked at Archippus, and Archippus was like, yes, I'm going to lean into that. And he did, and he started to live for Jesus. And his life was changed and transformed. And Paul would say of his life, man, this, this man is such a strong man for Christ that he is a soldier of Jesus. He's willing to go into the battle, not give up, and weather the difficult things for the good of God. And when Christ is first in our church, we're remaining faithful just like Paul writing this greeting with my own hand, he said, remember my chains. Grace be with you. Paul didn't give up just because he was in prison. I'm sure he was discouraged. I'm sure there was a time where he was like, I don't know if I can keep going on, if this is what it's going to be like. But you know what he did? He got back on his face. He said, God, give me encouragement. Help me to hear from this. And Aristarchus next to him is like giving him encouragement. And the two of them are just encouraging one another and standing strong in the faith. And then he's hearing the testimony of the Colossians and their faith. And he's sending out a word and he's remaining faithful. Friends, if, if we're going to do that, we have to remain faithful. I think of my precious wife. I gave her as a, 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 an example of, uh, of sharing her faith last week. I, I, but I, I just think of how she has been such a, an example of this. You know, because our church is coming up on 15 years old. It's kind of 15 years old for the core group, but for 15 years, she has gone through the battles. She has endured the difficulties. She has sacrificed greatly. And she has continued when her heart's been broken, when people have failed her, when people have written her nasty letters and, and, and she's forgiven them and released them, when she continues to stand faithful even though her husband is not perfect all the time and she waits for me to grow and she prays for me to grow. And I'll tell you, man, she's a great example of this. Not giving up, continuing to lean into her gifting, continuing to grow and remaining faithful. Are you remaining faithful? You can start that journey today. You can change that story on your life today. When Christ is first in our church, 
We are serving, growing, willing to suffer, forgiving, stewarding our gifts, and remaining faithful. Can we do something together? Would you do one last thing with me? Everybody take your hands like this, if you wouldn't mind. All right? All right? We're all doing it together, so if you do it wrong, you're all right. Many other people are going to get it wrong, too. Just take your hands and put them together like this. Okay, interlock your fingers. Your fingers should be down, right? Some of you are like, like this? No, like this. There you go. Now slowly close your hand, not too hard because it hurts. Right? Now repeat after me. This is the church. Here is the steeple. Open it up. And there's all the people, right? Well done. All of the Grace Kids teachers are just loving it right now. I did that this morning. That's awesome, right? I just got to tell you, Sunday school was wrong. They were just wrong, all right? Sorry, Sunday school teachers. I, I used to teach that too. It was wrong. This is not the church. This is a building. This is a steeple. That goes on top of the building. still part of the building. It's just a building. That building's going to be gone. This is the church. This is the church. This is the church, and they are a people who put Jesus first. Are you part of that church? I hope you are. Let's pray.